I will start with a little bit of context about uh, why we, we developed this Melissa project and, and why we need it. So we have the International Space Station that is 400 kilometers above our heads. Uh, and if we compare this to uh, the distance from the Earth to Mars, Mars is a million times further away uh, from the Earth than the International Space Station. Because when Mars and the Earth are the furthest apart, uh, it's 400 millions of kilometers apart. So if there, when there is a problem on the International Space Station, or if there is a problem, people can uh, come back to the Earth within a few hours. And they also can get resupply uh, from Earth regularly. This is what happens. Uh, cargo ship res resupplied the International Space Station every few months with oxygen, water, food. Uh, this cannot work for a Mars mission because it already takes six to eight months to reach the planet. And per day, a human being needs about five kilograms of oxygen, water, and food to survive. So if we do the math for a thousand day mission with a six people crew, this adds up to be 30 tons. So these would mean a huge mass to bring to the red planet. So recycling in this case is really the key for long duration space missions. So we need a system that can regenerate the air, recycle water, treat wastes, and produce food. This is what we call a regenerative life support system. So the European Space Agency has been working for nearly 30 years on a research project whose aim is to provide a closed life, uh, a closed loop life support system. So uh, this project is what we call MELISA, the Microecological Life Support System Alternative. It's an artificial ecosystem, which is divided into five independent compartments. They are based on recycling and circularity. So the wastes of the crew are degraded and transformed by bacteria into elements that can be fed to plants and microalgae that will produce oxygen and food, absor absorb the carbon dioxide and transpire fresh water. So the underlying principle of this loop is the Lavoisier principle, the mass, mass conservation principle that nothing is gained, nothing is lost, everything is transformed. All the processes in the Melissa loop are interdependent functions. So everything needs to be tested ahead of time, characterized, and well controlled. So the efficiency of each of the sub-processes need to be demonstrated for each compartment. For people that can, can see it at home, just remind us what those, those five elements are then. Talk yeah. us through it. So we have the, uh, the, the crew compartment uh, that is on top. And these crew compartments uh, generate waste. These weights are degraded and transformed by three bacterial compartments, one, two, three, uh, on the graphics. And these, um, these uh, elements that are products from this transformation are then fed to plants and algae. And plants and algae, using light, uh, do what we call photosynthesis they absorb the carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. While they do that, they also produce fresh water by transpiring, and they also produce food by just growing. And then the, the crew can use th these plants to eat, and of course to breathe and uh, recycle water. So that's how we close the loop. And, and how efficient have you managed to get it so far? Is, is there a is there still waste or have you managed to make it zero waste? How close are we to, to closing that loop? So uh, we are very close to, to, to closing that loop. There is a, um, so there are multiple approaches in parallel for, uh, for Melissa. Melissa is a research project. So the aim is really to show that we can have a, a full scale uh, closed loop on the ground first. Yeah. There, there is a ground demonstrator uh, of Melissa in Barcelona with the five compartments. Each compartment is 
studied independently first, and then they are linked together. And at the moment, uh, in Barcelona, there are three compartments that are linked together. So we have a crew compartment that is linked to a spirulina compartment that is linked to a nat night refining compartment, the compartment number three here, which means um, like there is urine uh, that is compartment three, basically the night refining compartment is uh, is doing. Uh, something similar to urine um, treatment. So we fed this compartment with urine. We have a degradation of these uh, elements. We, we can use it for spirulina. And spirulina, which is a microalgae, uses also the carbon dioxide from a crew compartment and produces oxygen that the crew is breathing. So we have these uh, three compartments linked together in Barcelona now. Amazing. And at the same time, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> so, uh, but there are two elements that are still not linked up. Yes. Okay. These are not linked to the full loop yet. And, and why is that? Are there particular challenges for those? Yeah, it's an incremental approach, uh, the, uh, the approach of Melissa. Everything uh, since Okay, since we are in a confined environment, um, each small variation of environmental parameters can cause an unbalance in the whole loop. So before we can link everything together, we need to have a full characterization of each process, each compartment. We need to, um, to be able to model them because use, when we model a compartment, we can understand better what is uh, what are the processes involved, what is going on. So everything needs to be uh, to be very well modeled, understood, characterized, tested before they can be linked together. Um, there is there is also the um, the the problem of uh, of trace elements because. Um, well, there can be some unwanted elements like physical particles or chemical pollutants or uh, pathogens that will build up uh, after time if nothing is done to prevent that. So there is a strong controlled strategy uh, being involved into uh, the Melissa loop. So all of these approaches need to be uh, followed in parallel. The experimental approach an integration approach in the ground demonstrator, the modeling approach to understand how the processes work, as well as the uh, control approach. And in parallel, we also have the uh, flight demonstrator, uh, like the flight demonstrator for uh, some parts of the loop that, um, that are flown to the ISS, for example, to understand how a process will react to space conditions. Are there also any of these applications uh, of the Melissa project used in projects on Earth? Yes, um, there, there are many of them. And this is a, um, another part uh, of, the, of the Melissa project. It's really another uh, another branch. So there is like there is the the, the research branch, the uh, demonstrator branch, uh, all these branches, and there is uh, all the Earth applications as well. And there is um, so the uh, the the reason why there there are these applications is because um, we we have uh, the we have long considered Earth as an infinite pool of resources. Although um, we see now that uh, we, we're, we are seeing the limits. So we cannot consider it as a limited pool of resources where we can just uh, uh, generate as much waste as we want. The buffer effect of the Earth is, uh, is really showing the limits. The, when we, we set uh, our mind to uh, a confined environment in space, 
uh, we have to think differently. And this is what Melissa is doing because we, we don't have these buffer systems in, in space. We cannot absorb the unbalances of the system. So we, um, we have to think outside of the box and all of these uh, technologies that were de developed for space, for space missions, could, can be uh, applied uh, again. So really in space, all the waste we generate needs to be resources again. We cannot just uh, vent out elements that we, we don't want uh, anymore. Everything needs to be transformed and reused. Um, there is a, a company uh, called IP Star, which is which ensures the technology transfer uh, from the listed technologies from space applications to Earth applications. So that's that's what we call spin-offs. And, um, and there there are some projects in water treatment. Uh, for example, um, the biosteer technology for water treatment that is used in Europe is marketed by Veolia. It it is uh, it was initiated by a Melissa water treatment technology. And is that being used uh, on a on a big scale? Sorry. Is that being used on a big scale now? Yeah, it's about it's hundred millions of liter of water treated each year in Europe. In the Martian. Uh, but films like that, how close do they get to actually representing what those scenarios might be like? So when things started to go very badly for him, I think he was using that principle of redundancy and trying to, to do many different things with objects and systems that weren't maybe designed to do that as their primary function. How close did they get to, to what it might actually be like? Well, um, so it's a... It's a it's a good story. <laughs> uh, no, it's but it's a uh, it's quite real. Well, it's it, it's quite realistic on many aspects. Not everything. There are some things that are not uh, realistic, like the, the the storm at the beginning, for example. In terms of, uh, I will talk about what I, I I work on mostly. In terms of growing food, for example, um, the the idea in itself. Is um, is almost correct. Uh, the idea to make some sort of compost and mix it with uh, with the soil to grow plants, it's it's correct. It's it's. Uh, but the problem is is that it's a it's an idea, an Earth idea directly applied to Mars, where things should be a little bit more controlled if we don't want to have sanitary problems. In this case, growing potatoes as it did would not have worked as well uh, for two main reasons. First, there are some, uh, some chemical, well, some chemical elements in the Martian soil that are uh, bad for plants. They are toxic. Uh, second, if you use human excrements to grow plants, um, you are likely to, to, to transfer pathogens and become sick. In this case, it was his own experiment, so it was okay. But if you if you use other human beings' experiment, you will have a, um, a contamination of pathogens if if they are pathogens. Um, and when you mix um, waste like this with uh, with Martian soil, you end up having a system that you don't really control. You don't control the the microbes, the bacteria inside. Um, so you could have something developing that you are not expecting, especially um, with uh, radiations coming to Mars. You could have bacteria mutating and, and then not being able to, to fight it. So when we think about growing plants on Mars, we, we are not envisioning growing them with soil, but using hydroponics, where you have a solution with water and nutrients, and you can really control what you put inside. You control the pH, you control the salt concentration, you control if there are any pathogen, any um, chemical pollutants, etc. And then you are sure that the plants are not accumulating toxins or, um, or, or just being sick and then you get sick in winter.